Hello, 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 and welcome back to Key Lights here on Prince of Community Television. I'm Misha. I'm Misha. And here with us today, we have Robert Seda Schreiber, who is the chief activist here at the Bayard Rustin Center for Social Justice. So to start us off, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what the center is all about? Oh my gosh, well there's your 15 minutes right there. <laughs> um, I was a school teacher for uh, almost 25 years, a middle school art teacher. Um, and in the classroom, I was always advocating for my students. I wanted my classroom to be a safe space. I wanted them to feel not only comfortable, but respected, protected, and free to speak their minds and open their hearts. And um, I enjoyed that very, very much for many, many years. And I, it was an extraordinary honor um, to be in the classroom and to be able to be that teacher that kids felt comfortable coming to. Um, and I was able to do a lot of wonderful things in the classroom. I was able to be a Fulbright Memorial Fund scholar to Japan and travel to Japan to represent our country. I was able to be named the um, champion of equality for the state of New Jersey. And then finally, in 2017, I was named the National Education Association Social Justice Activist of the Year. And at that point, when I was giving the keynote in Boston at the Human and Civil Rights Conference, I realized that there was a larger platform, that there was more maybe I could do. That I loved my classroom and I loved my kids, but maybe there was some other way I could use this honor that I was given to represent more folks and to be more involved in the community and do larger outreach. Um, so I went on a journey, um, a personal journey of and never my strong suit, listening. Um, I went out and I spoke to other organizations, other individuals, other people who are making a difference across our state and across our country. I got involved in various causes, ideas, platforms, organizations, wanted to know what they needed, how they needed it, and how they could be best served. Um, and what I quickly realized is that there were people and groups and communities doing incredible works, doing unbelievable things. Um, but there was no central coming together, that all these groups were doing all these wonderful things, but there was this um, disparate nature to all of it. So this group was speaking for this group, and this group was speaking for this group. And of course there was collaboration, and I'm not the first one to speak on collaboration in any way, shape, or form, and I'm not taking that um, as my own. But what I wanted to do was really, in a very solid and foundational way, bring it together. So I started to listen more and more, and then react as time came, and I could hear what was out there. And I visited so many folks, and in that I realized that we're having a, a, a difficult time in our nation right now, in our culture. That. Uh, people are feeling hopeless, that from on high we're hearing messages not of love, not of acceptance, but the exact opposite. And that disturbs a great many people and it disturbs me too. But I also think that there's a tremendous opportunity here for us to finally come together, for us to realize that when one group steps forward, we all step forward. So what I did was I found a hero of mine for many, many years, but realized that, that he was the epitome of what I had been thinking about and what I had been dreaming of. And his name is Bayard Rustin. And Bayard Rustin is an incredible, important figure in intersectionality, which is what we need right now, bringing together all these groups. And many people don't know this, and this is one of the, the true tragedies. Um, and when I say this, it seems like I'm engaging in hyperbole, but I'm certainly not. Bayard Rustin planned the march in 63. Bayard Rustin inspired the Freedom Riders. Bayard Rustin brought the very principle of nonviolence from his studies uh, in India with followers of Gandhi himself. He brought that to Dr. King, and they debated and discussed and argued for an entire evening from dusk till dawn, and this is historical record. And at the end of the day, that morning, Dr. King threw all his guns out, took all the guns out of the house. And he had every right 
I mean, his family was being threatened with physical and emotional and psychological harm every day. So of course he wanted, and as a father and a husband, to defend himself and his family, even more so. But he realized what Bayrus was saying was the absolute truth, that this movement was to mean anything to anybody, that it had to espouse the values of treating each other with peace. And so after that, Bayrus became integral to the, um, to the movement, but here's the tragedy, that by Rustin was a gay man, and because of who he was and whom he loved, and because he took great pride in it as well he should have, he was excised from the tales told and edited out of the history books entirely. And this was a time not only when, when it wasn't de rigueur to be out and proud, but it was actually against the law. And he was arrested, um, and he was actually put on a chain gang and for 18 months of his life, he spent behind bars just because of who the man was. And that is heartbreaking. So our Bayard Wilson Center for Social Justice, our very foundation, is to make sure that never happens to anyone ever again, whether it's a leader of a movement, whether it's a student in a classroom, whether it's a person in an office, or anybody in any community, that they're not left behind or silenced or disrespected, or disenfranchised, or even bullied ever again. And that's what our programming is all about. That's what we want to represent. So to put it in concrete terms, this is the way our weeks go. And when I say this, this is really a usual week for us. Um, on Monday, we had the great honor of, of co-organizing co a rally on Heinz Plaza here in Princeton with the Coalition for Peace Action, with the Reverend Robert Moore, who is also, I can proudly say, a member of our board of directors. We co-organized this rally. We had um, over 350 people came out to say, there's no emergency. There's no wall that's needed. In fact, we need to break down walls. We need to stop saying other people are the other, and that each and every one of us deserves respect and kindness and acceptance. So as we did on Monday, we had a rally of 350 people. Then later in the week, we had five high school students come in and say, we want to have a safe space for us and our friends and our allies. Um, so every Friday afternoon, henceforth, from now on, here at the center from 3 to 6, there's going to be a safe space hangout. Anybody who wants to come from elementary, middle, and high school can come and be a part of our center and feel that comfort and that acceptance and that love. Um, and then on Saturday night, well, Saturday afternoon, we had a drag queen story hour at Labyrinth Books, who is another wonderful partner and beautiful folks who work there. Um, and they co-sponsored with us a uh, drag queen story hour with our, I think we're the only community center, I think, who has a drag queen in residence, Harmonica Sunbeam, who is phenomenal. She did a drag queen story hour and then that evening came back here to our center and we had drag queen full on extravaganza. We had over 50 people here and it was the most beautiful moment of love and funk and lights and sound and music and people just laughing and crying and singing and just feeling that moment. And what's wonderful, it wasn't only a lot of something that performed that night, but four other drag queens. We had five drag queens in the house, no waiting. And every one of them donated their time and their tips that night to the center. And this is Saturday night. I'm sure that's their bread and butter. But they were here because they believed in what we do, too. Um, and what was really beautiful about that is that one of those drag queens, above and beyond everything else, was a former student of mine. So if, that, if nothing else tells me I did a pretty good job as a teacher, that I had the lady, the lady Victoria Cortez come back here and dance at my center after being a student in my classroom. That means the world to me. That means the world to me. I mean, I think it's incredible that we're going to have our, our grand opening coming out party on Saturday, March 2nd. And uh, Councilman Tim Quinn is going to be here. And Mayor Liz Lampert's going to be here. And Assemblyman Andrews Wicker is going to be here. And that's a huge honor, a huge honor. I am over the moon 
that we're in such a supportive, beautiful community. But the fact that my former student came in here and did that, it's never not going to bring a huge smile to my face and tears to my eyes. That's so touching. Oh my gosh. I'm trying to keep it composed here on camera. But that's like. Please don't. This is a safe space. Please don't be composed at all. No composure necessary. That's so beautiful. So, um, how long has the center been in the works? All right, so that's a, that's a great question, and I kind of didn't answer that before, and I apologize. I tend to um, go off on tangents, and um, Shakespeare would be very disappointed in me. Brevity is not the soul of my wit. Um, so again, this was a dream that started. This is a dream that started. I marched on Washington in the womb. My parents created a safe space in our house. So that's why I always knew. And they never lectured me. They never said, "This is how we respect others. This is how we love others. This is how we make a difference." They just did it, and that's how I learned. And that's how I was brought up. Um, so they've always allowed me that opportunity to learn from them and with them and show me love and kindness and I would show up at my house and my friends would be in my house without me there but my friends were freaks and geeks and others and those who weren't accepted elsewhere and they knew that my parents had established this community in the house itself so that's how I grew up and then I met my lovely bride, who, you know, I may put boots on the ground every day as chief activist here, but she does the work. She's a public defender, and she um, is in Trenton at the Health Division, and she does, the work she does, just, I'm in awe. But not only that, is she supported me and the center and allowed me to take this time and allowed me to find what this was going to be. Um, and by the way, just to clarify, there was a whole year where I was doing this where I wasn't paid, where I decided that I, I wasn't going to take any salary until our programming was set, until I knew that our people and our facilities and our programming was going to be what it needed to be. That was really important to me. And I also wanted to set up all our foundations. So when we came out, we came out strong. So I set up our 501c3, our nonprofit status. I set up, I got, um, I just didn't put Bia Rustin's name on our door. I actually, again, through my wife's prodding as my uh, in-house counsel, um, told me I needed to get permission from his foundation. And what that turned into, and I was really terrified about that, because what if they said no? And I was like, but he's perfect. He's such a hero, he's someone who needs this and they are reluctant sometimes because it is difficult out there and there becomes a lot of resistance um, but I was able to talk directly to his partner who's still alive and Walter Nagel is his name and Walter Nagel is an inspiration in and of himself and he gave me permission to use the name um, and that's something that was one of our first real allowances of this is going to be something extraordinary um, and then I set up our board of directors, which for every nonprofit, you have to have a board of directors, you have to have bylaws, you have to have all these things that you follow so you know you're serving the public trust. And I just didn't want to set up a board of directors just for the fundamentals of it. I want to make sure our board of directors represented a different community, a different voice, someone that we could bring to the people. Um, so I got such a diverse group of people and again I look at their names and I call them, I email them, I hear from them and I think if they believe in what we're doing then we're doing something right. You know and that involves the Reverend Robert Moore from the Coalition for Peace Action right here in Princeton who for over four decades has been doing the incredible works that he does. You know and I I you know he we always talk and he says call me Bob and I Pepper Ken. It's always been Reverend Moore because he is just the end all be all. But then I also have Carol Watchler. Carol Watchler was our first board member that came aboard. And she, for over 50 years, has been doing boots on the ground. She, you know, is involved with now New Jersey. She was involved with so many groups. And she established 
um, with other folks, uh, the Central New Jersey GLSEN chapter, and GLSEN is the Gay Lesbian Straight Education Network. There are national groups and they have local chapters in each state. She helped to establish the one here in our community, and for, over t for almost 20 years she ran that as the co-chair uh, with Paula Rodriguez Rust, who's also a wonderful person. Um, but she came aboard our board. She was our first person to put her, her name and her spirit behind us. And now I'm really proud to say that she is sharing with my space. She has an office in the other wing of the uh, manor, as it were, um, as our community outreach coordinator. And again, I get to look down the hall and see one of my heroes every day. Um, also on our board are um, Robin Parker, who is the head of um, Beyond Diversity, which is a group doing incredible work um, for um, our community of uh, people of color and dealing with issues in that community. And I'm so glad that he gets to bring that to us. We have David Saylor, who is um, an incredible union organizer and was uh, heavily involved with the AFL-CIO for many, many years and then started his own company where he goes across the nation and in South America representing workers and workers' rights. Um, and many other folks who represent us in, in wide diversity of issues. But we also have community liaisons, and our community liaisons are just as important to me as our board of directors um, because they really, on a daily basis, bring to me the concerns of their community. And our community liaisons, we have over a dozen now, and they represent folks who are transgender, who are uh, members of, um, you know, the Latina community, um, members of various different voices, shapes, sizes, colors, and everything you can imagine. Because the truth is, I'm sitting here, standing here, as chief activist of this center, it's about social justice, and I'm a straight white guy, right? I know I speak from privilege, and I want to make sure I use that privilege in the most appropriate, strong way. And the only way that you can do that righteously is by never, ever purporting to speak for somebody, but to speak with somebody, and to allow them to come forward and speak for themselves. So I'm really a conduit. I'm really a bridge for other communities. I want to bring people together. So what I do is I will always, when asked to speak on an issue or to speak on, uh, you know, to go somewhere, be somewhere, or do something, make sure that I'm bringing the folks who are directly involved with me so they can be directly involved with that. And honestly, the goal of my job is to put myself out of a job. I hope that I don't have to be that bridge, that conduit. I'm hoping that communities can come together. But until then, if I can do this good work for as long as I can do it, for as long as it's necessary, then that's what I'm going to do. All right, we're going to move on to a different section of the interview now and like look around this beautiful space. Everything you've said has absolutely put me in awe. This, this work you're doing is amazing. and. Can't wait to show our viewers around the center. Thank you so much. Thank I you. I appreciate that. I look forward to showing you the rest of the space. So I know that you have this crown symbol in your office at work on your arm. So yes. what does it mean? All right, so this um, is uh, Basquiat. And Basquiat is one of my favorite artists, but also a great story because he is a graffiti artist doing his work, being arrested on the streets of New York, and then all of a sudden his work was selling for millions of galleries, right? Um, it's important that we hear those voices, people from the streets, people from underprivileged communities, and they're able to not only succeed, but have people understand their stories. Um, personally, uh, I got this tattoo right after I won my award uh, nationally, and it keeps me grounded and humble. And I remember that all the work I do, it's never perfect. I'm not perfect. I am uh, doing the best I can. I'm doing the best works I can. I'm always surrounded by wonderful people like yourselves. Um, and um, I think of it as being an imperfect king. That we do the best we can, we serve the people the best we can, but we always remember that we can do better and be better and be less selfish and self-involved and be more self-aware. <laughs> That's beautiful. 
So I know that you wanted to talk about the library that you're building here at the center. Yes. So I'm really proud. One of our other community liaisons is Janie Herman. Janie Herman is a dynamo in this town. She is uh, with the Princeton Public Library, and she's someone that um, I connected with really early on, before we even had a space here. Um, we talked about uh, all we could dream and scheme together. We became an official community partner of the library, which I'm really, really proud of as well. But then we talked about literature is so important to both of us, obviously, and how better to communicate social justice than through words and images and ways to connect with people. So I am so thrilled that we're creating this library here at the center. It's going to be an actual lending library so people can take the books out, bring them home, share them with others, and hopefully bring them back. At least we'll have a way to catalog them. Um, but we want to bring as many voices as possible, obviously, to the center. We can't bring everybody in, so let's bring this literature to share as best we can. And uh, I will say this, that we do have an Amazon wish list that people can go to. They can find it under the center's name on our website as well. Um, we'd love to have books donated. It's really important that not only our youth, but our entire community, especially our, our elders too, have a place where they can come and know that they can find out information that's really important, be inspired by other people's journeys and words, poetry, fiction, nonfiction, children's books, books for people of all ages, all communities. And we're building it now. We have one shelf. We want to have four. We want to have at least three or four hundred books here. They want to rotate and that people can come and check out. I know we have, you know, a block away, an incredible library right there. Um, but I want our center to be a, a small auxiliary spot that people can come to as well. Um, so we're really proud of that. Thank you for asking. Sounds great. So, um, do you mind mentioning like some kind of events that you're going to be hosting? Yeah, I'm really, I'm, I'm really not comfortable self-promoting at all. So <laughs> I'm just going to leave that one okay. aside. Um, well, so this is, uh, we have our coming out grand opening on March 2nd. That's Saturday. Uh, from 1 to 4 p.m. And then um, what we do is we do advocacy and we do professional development for schools, for businesses, for individuals. So if anybody needs our services, you can go to our website and see what we offer. Um, and of course, we offer everything we offer, everything we do is on a sliding scale. So it's pay what you can. Um, so if a business comes to us, we hope they'll be able to donate and, and support the good works we do. If a nonprofit comes to us, another group comes to us that does good work, of course we're going to work with them to the best of both of our abilities. Um, I'm really proud to say, um, with um, this is incredible to me, that we're going to offer um, therapy here um, at least twice a week. Uh, open hours, we'll have two windows a week where our LGBTQIA youth can come in and get the help they need. And that will be on a pay what you can uh, basis. So whatever you can afford, whatever you think it's worth to you, that's what we'll take. Never, no service that we provide will ever not be open and available to anybody for any reason whatsoever. This is an open safe space and you can't have an open safe space if you're doing things that anybody is ever excluded from. So um, we will always offer everything on a sliding scale. Um, it's pay what you can, it's what you think is fair, it's when you walk in the door, how can we help you and how can you help us? That's the way community works, that's the very essence of community. Um, and we have tremendous programming coming down the line, you know, and it, it's, it's a wonderful balance of um, strong advocacy, strong civics. My um, wife, who I mentioned before, is a public defender. Her name is Cindy. She's doing a, a program called La Lucha, which is going to be helping teens become better advocates, better civic-minded civic citizens. You know, we're never going to move forward unless we teach our youth how to move forward in the best way possible, so how to protect themselves, what their rights are, how they can speak for themselves and for others, how to advocate, how to know how to be a member of this community and our country. We're going to have a gardening club where we're going to, um, this is wonderful, we had 
a great teacher who, one of the things we do is we establish grace free alliances across the state and across the country. And someone that we went to advocate for in Perth Amboy um, loved her and I asked her to come aboard as a community liaison. I thought she'd come aboard to um, speak for her community. And her real strength and her passion was urban gardening for education. She believes that it's important for us to learn how to grow our own food, how to use that food, nutritional and otherwise. So she came aboard as someone who taught us, and I never thought this would be part of what we do, urban gardening and free education. So we're going to offer starting uh, in just two weeks in March, we're going to use this space to have tremendous gardens, the whole community can be involved, grow your own food, learn how to prepare it, learn what it means nutritionally and otherwise. Um, so we're constantly growing. We're going to have a poetry workshop. We're going to do um, a create your own fanzine. So we're going to do this wonderful social justice comics and graphic novels and writing. So we're going to publish uh, a zine that we can, um, you know, promote social justice. And that's not only for youth, that's for all ages. And uh, speaking of that, you know, I've been talking a lot about youth, but our elders are really important to me too. And I believe that we have to respect and protect them and have a voice for them. And we're working with a, a bunch of organizations to make sure that those groups are going to be spoken for as well and represented here at our center. So those are some of the things we're doing. There's a lot more on the horizon. You can visit us at uh, rustincenter.org. That's our website. It's pretty robust and you can go through and please look at all the pages and see what we're doing. Um, we keep a pretty somewhat strong social media um, identity. We have a nice bit on Facebook and you can see up to the minute what we're doing. I try to post there and keep people involved. Um, we do pretty well on Twitter. Um, I have a handle on Twitter. It's a Twitter joke. Um, Instagram, I try my best. I, you know, we have like 200 followers. So come visit us on, on Instagram because that's not my strength. Um, you can call us anytime. Visit us anytime. I'm here every day. I walk in this building with a big, dumb, goofy grin on my face every day because I get to do this work. And it's beautiful to me. But I don't do it alone. Um, as I said, I hope that I really communicated this, and this will, this will be the last bit, obviously, because the alarm went off. Um, I have a tremendous support system behind me from my family, my parents, who taught me love and respect, from my wife and my son, who continue the journey with me, and all our board of directors, our community liaisons, and everybody that walks in our door each and every day. Those are the people that matter. Those are the people that make the Bayard and Center for Social Justice mean something and move forward. I am just the vehicle. Everybody else allows it to be a success and to be the magic that it is.